Hello guys and glad I have you on board again today. This is going to be number three and finale for this introduction to uh, psychology in trading using some little bites of neurobiology in there. So the first uh, lesson we've made out there was to set the ground basis for this stuff we will be using and build upon. Uh, and that's what we've done on the previous podcast in here as well, talking about the uncertainty bias and how we can favor some positive loopholes and positive feedback loops in which we can get uh, to indirectly act on our limbic system using the area in which we can actually uh, um, rationally act and see early results, which is using cortical functions, which is the most neuroplastic area into our brain, the one we can actually act upon consciously. Because of course, the limbic system is far less neuroplastic and it's pretty much going and acting at subconscious level, which means we cannot really act upon this, but using indirect manner. So that was the perspective I introduced into the previous perspective in here. Uh, today we're going to add up on, on top of this and talking about the, ins, uh, the impatience bias, uh, which is another way that's creating another frictions into your brain and basically can create as well some positive loopholes and positive feedback loops just as negative ones. So we're going to try expressing which are the good ones, which are the bad ones, how to positively act upon this. And once again, just as a reminder, it takes a freaking huge amount of time in any way to get to progress into psychology. It's not something you're going to have the rewards in a week or two weeks, whatever. It's going to take months anyhow. And I give you an approximate six month uh, uh, period to actually be able to forecast uh, to review the progress you've made. So at some point in time, you will just scroll back and just remember what, we, what you were doing just six months ago, and you'll see that your psychological management it was totally uh, different than it is today. So it's definitely how it goes. It takes a long time to actually process, and it needs a recurring process to actually work its way toward your goal. So that is what we've experienced and introduced last uh, on last podcast. If there is no recurring analysis perspective, then simply things get deteriorated over time. It's something that that you build one step at a time, but you need to put the steps into the same direction. Use the same things. Remember those uh, safe islands we've seen into the previous things. This is what you need. This, those safe islands, even though they're somehow mm, distortions of the reality, they exist in the market. This is risk management. This is a belief. Remember what we've said. But those islands are the only areas in which you can survive chaos. Otherwise, anything else is this chaos and trying to make sense out of it and to analyze it, it's just going to be a waste of time, waste of energy. And sooner or later, if you analyze chaos, it's just a matter of time until the amygdala takes over. And anything you're going to get out of this is just that the next time your brain is going to shut the fuck up the cortex sooner and sooner and sooner and trigger amygdala in response faster and faster and fasters by reinforcing this mesolimbic pathway we've talked about, okay? As you get out of stress, there is a dopamine release and only you can choose which way you want to release it. And that depends on what part of the brain you've been using to solve the puzzle, okay? Anyway, so aside from this, today we're going to talk about something else, uh, about patience and impatience. And basically, I thought about starting with something you probably already know about. You probably heard a lot of shit about it anyway. So yeah, we're going to go down this road. We're going to talk about the marshmallow experiment, the things we do uh, to our children to have fun and see their reactions. So anyway, let's jump into this. Okay, so either you know Walter Mitchell or not, you already probably all know about the marshmallow experiment. Just make it simple for those who don't. It's basically you take a child four, year, four years old because this is basically the specific uh, time in our uh, mental constructions that we get to work around a very specific area into our frontal lobe, the one that takes care of... Uh, um, uh, delayed gratification. That's the most well-known way of dealing with this, which is basically, uh, let's explain the experiment. You'll know what this is about. So you take a children, uh, any children, you put it into a room. It has to be alone with just the experimenter. Uh, the room must be absolutely empty of any other stimuli or stimuli or whatever. And just the experimenter gets into the room, takes a plate with a marshmallow, put it in front of the uh, um, 
uh, of the infant and basically tells him one simple thing. I'm going to go back 15 minutes from now and if the marshmallow is still there, I'm going to give you a second one. And then the experimenter just leaves the room for 15 minutes and the child is under camera for those 15 minutes and we basically studied our reactions. Great! Okay, of course, lots of fun, because as this is the moment, specific moment uh, um, in the child growth, that basically this area gets to be formed or very, very malleable, very neuroplastic at that point. So it's very funny because basically most of the infants are experiencing most of the common reactions out there. Of course, what we need to take out of this is one very important stuff, is that basically we don't nearly give a shit about the... Uh, uh, young boys or young girls reactions that's just funny okay that's advertising uh, uh, but um, uh, that's entertaining sorry but no more than that okay so what we care about is actually Walter Mitchell's comments on this and what it has actually has managed to do to study the real thing because of course when a psychiatric gets to an answer it's going to try varying some uh, modulating some inputs to see what actually is all at play so what they've done is managing preconditions and playing around hunger and whether the uh, infant is uh, uh, under hunger or not but prior to the experience and how much it actually changes the result they also have been working around attractiveness of uh, um, the stimuli, which is basically uh, taking out the, the, the marshmallow and putting some kind of a pretzel, far less uh, attractive at some point, okay, and it seriously changes the result. Test duration as well, of course, really influence the thing. So yeah, the duration and the exposition to this stress obviously in, um, impact a lot on how many people will self-control and wait for the entire 15 minutes time. Or not and of course if you change 15 minutes to 30 minutes you'll get much people much more people surrendering to stress and there is also a very less uh, understood one which is confidence in a tester which is basically if the tester has less confidence uh, uh, from the child then it basically seriously impact well, seriously it's a pretty big word out there but it changes somehow the results so confidence is somehow important into how you manage self-control reactions okay confidence in the tester so when here we're going to have to transpose this into trading for, to of course get to use this so what would be the preconditions basically are you into a favorable mood or is your external environment a favorable or unfavorable that's going to obviously impact the way you're going to be able to self-control impatience biases okay attractiveness of the stimuli basically in here is going to be the natural attractiveness you got with the I mean, we're talking about trading assets in here. So what kind of attractiveness could you get with a financial uh, um, instrument? So there is some stuff. Like I personally have been uh, pretty attracted to Tesla back in the years when I got started trading because I got lots of gains from Tesla and then they actually wrecked 30% of my account in just a few seconds. So it was really hell of a thing for me back then. So really attracted by Tesla and it could have impacted, it actually did a lot, my ability to self-control impatience biases. Anyway, test duration is very important for us. That means basically, okay, if you get to go over long-term investment immediately, like you don't even know how to speculate and you want to long-term invest, yeah, of course, but the timescales in here are going to be so massive that it, it is exactly the same as in seriously increasing the test duration. You're going to be submitted to some heavy amount of uh, a stress due to impatience biases. And basically in here, your ability to self-control will rapidly deteriorate. So starting with long-term time frame, definitely not a good thing, but you understand why, okay? It's because it's going to work very hard on your impatience biases. And finally, confidence in the tester, it might be okay, but basically if you're learning someone else's strategy but doesn't have full confidence, basically that's not real great it's going to deteriorate self-control basically if you're using my tool and if you say all right i don't know i don't trust this context thing whatever yeah of course it's not perfect it's never going to be but you need to have at least a decent level of trust on those tools otherwise just don't use them okay use some other tools if you want to don't worry about it i've told you that you totally can but anyway move in Moving on, what matters in here as well to add on top of this is the five techniques used by human beings to somehow manage the way through self-control and manage the patients through these 15 minutes. So 
every child is following one of those five rules and basically as you get to be a mature human being adult means you probably solidified and favored one of those five answers so what we care about in here is not necessarily figure all of them but knowing that normally as a mature human being you probably already favored one so just try to pick this one the one that seems the most logical to you is probably the one that you will get to use in order to progress these things that you use to distance yourself from an attractive stimuli will work just the same for impatience biases. So identify your personal pattern and learn to work with it. It's going to help you, okay? So how do you do? Some people tend to use, and most people actually tend to use, reducing the sensorial, the, the sensorial stimulus. So basically what that means is you hide the stuff or you're basically going to... Uh, um, uh, do anything you can to just put it as far away as possible from your sensory captors, okay? So that's the most commonly used stuff. Reducing the reward expectancy is basically, um, you're going to say, all right, I I'm definitely going to wait for this second thing, okay? They're pretty great, okay, of course. Uh, I like this thing, I like this marshmallow, but, I mean, it's just a marshmallow, okay? Because it actually helps you not wanting too much of the one you actually have right now in front of you. You say, okay, two is definitely much better than one. I'm willing to self-control and go patience. Uh, but if I think too much about how good this thing is, then it might actually force me to act right now. And consider that at some point, one is better right now than waiting for 15 minutes, a second one. That's what we call value depreciation. Uh, this is a psychological assessment in here. I'm not going to go down this road, otherwise it would take way too much, way too longer. But if you want to go dive into this experiment, there's plenty of valuable stuff to get. The second and very common answer in here is distanciation to distraction, which is basically uh, putting some distance with the thing, trying to fly away or use external distractions, which is the one the child uh, were unable to do because, of course, there were no distractions in there. So either you use imagination, you, I don't know, you just put your finger into your nose or whatever. This is exactly the type of thing we're talking, the type of thing we're talking about. Uh, playing with whatever is at disposal to just try taking uh, uh, no action and patienting, okay? Abstraction is a very less common thing but still happening, which is basically you're going to still focus your attention on this thing because you just can't get away from it, but you're going to change the context, saying, all right, I might be in a room where only this thing is attractive, but basically if I put it into a much more attractive environment, then this thing gets less attractive. This is one way people get to overcome the problem uh, and putting some... Uh, uh, of idea, let's say more attractive context that indirectly depreciates the attractiveness of the stuff, okay? Using abstraction by replacing context. And self-related speaking is basically something that some people tend to do. They basically express through words their feeling, saying, all right, I definitely would like to get this thing, but damn it, I should wait. And yeah, Externalizing these things can help at some point making more rational decisions, which is all about self-control is supposed to be a rational decision, a frontal cortex decisions against amygdalon and limbic system stimuli, okay? So that's all about it, okay? Uh, uh, having cortical response, managing and regulating decisions from the limbic system, okay? So anyway, try to find which one is your favorite and just be able to use it into impatience biases. If you think yeah, you're confronted to impatience, then all right, you know that distanciation and distraction is your way to avoid stimuli. So just use it. Get the fuck away from the computer. Just use your phone, but get distracted in the meantime. If you have to wait, that's the best possible way you get to answer to this thing. Okay. Oh shit. Another set of brains. Oh, I, I hope it wouldn't be doing this. I'm sorry. I had to. Uh, so uh, anyway, it's necessary. So last time we've talked about dopamine uh, um, two pathways, the mesolimbic pathway and the mesocortical pathway, but this is for the expectancy of reward, which is basically anticipating reward system. And in that perspective, we've seen that there's two ways to release the, uh, the anticipated dopamine. And we definitely want to favor the mesocortical one, which is going to help us solving the problem, making the brain and specifically the prefrontal cortex area being uh, more efficient in terms of energy uh, stuff and whatever, because um, Simply to make it easy, your brain's going to work faster. So you're going to reach the conclusion or the answer and analyze the stuff you got to analyze faster, which makes it more efficient in terms of time. Okay. Uh, despite, on the opposite end, the possibility to use the mesolimbic pathway, which is naturally the most favorable one because we're sensitive human fucking beings. 
So if you do not actively work with your cortex, it's definitely the limbic system that takes over naturally. So the problem is if you solidify the mesolimbic system, we figured out that it is going to amplify uh, uh, amygdalin response to stress, and that is a very negative feedback loop out there. So that is for expectancy of, um, uh, of stress and therefore early release of dopamine to stimulate the brain to have a faster response to solutions. Okay, this is in... Uh, a solution that only occurs if there is a recurring situation, uh, okay? So confronted to the same type of problem. So recurring is, out, is definitely necessary out there if you want to get the positive thing, okay? Because being exposed to chaos, it's always going to be chaos. So if you're using your limbic pathways, then definitely any, situa any chaotic situation will be the same, okay? But if you need to make a rational decision with your cortex, you need to use the same rules, okay? If you change the set of rules, it doesn't work out. I hope you did understand that in the previous thing, okay? But when it's not an anticipated release, when actually it is about distanciated release, okay, delayed gratification, the brain doesn't necessarily use the same neurotransmitters. In here, you've got far higher chances to secrete serotonin instead. Or not instead, it's basically complementary. It's not zero or one. It's not just all about dopamine or serotonin. It's just gradient, shaded gray areas, okay? So how favorable serotonin is versus dopamine or, this, uh, or, or the reverse. So obviously we know dopamine is cool, but in here what we need to understand is that there are five receptors of, no, of dopamine into the brain, just one of them being into the frontal cortex. That's the one we want for the mesocortical pathway, but I mean, still means one chance out of five. So not that great and it definitely favors naturally the mesolimbic system instead. And we've seen that the amygdala is the favorable one in here. Serotonin instead has 14 different receptor area into the brain. It's basically uh, spreading all across the cortex. Uh, and this is real great in that perspective. A little bit, of course, in the limbic system in, in here, but mostly, mostly uh, into the cortical areas. So, which is great because we've got a one to three uh, uh, type, type of ratio in here that basically introduces something valuable for us. Because as dopamine has a targeted area, for the same amounts of neurotransmitters being transmitted, then basically the area is much more floated with neurotransmitters, uh, and therefore the impact is more sensitive. You're going to feel the difference. Dopamine is something you feel, or you can feel at some point, if there are high levels of dopamine stimulations. Serotonin instead is something much uh, spread it out, okay? So for the same amount of serotonin dissipated in the brain versus dopamine, you're going to get serotonin much more dissipated elsewhere. Another thing is that actually serotonin lasts a little longer than the dopamine, which means dopamine has a faster, more concentrated effect than serotonin, which is much more spread it out and lasts a little bit longer, which means dopamine is much, much more addictive. Of course, the brain favors things that are short-term versus long-term if you are not conditioned enough. So at some point, some brain will favor serotonin over time if they've been taught to, which means there is a self-training tool in here as well, positive feedback loop. As you get to use serotonin and to enjoy it, because actually dopamine is more like a pleasure-oriented stuff where serotonin is going to be much more comparable to happiness. If you get used to happiness, you'll say, okay, I don't give a shit about short-term pleasure. My brain likes serotonin, likes happiness. And in that perspective, you get yourself self-prepared uh, to go for a delayed uh, um, gratification system and therefore it naturally helps you getting better at managing patients so yeah getting used to be floated with serotonin has much more positive effect than dopamine so how do you get serotonin over dopamine is what we should care about of course it's very hard to come to, to to compile in here because there's a lots of other neurotransmitters at play but basically one factor that influence dopamine and serotonin percentage basis is basically how delayed. So the closer it is from the stimuli um, that you get the reward generally favors dopamine's release. 
okay? Just like the more the de- the, high, the longer the delay, the more favorable serotonin is going to be. So of course, what we're going to be learning in here is that, for example, a lot of the beginners getting into scalping because they know their impatience, and this most stupidest answer they're putting out there is, "All right, I'm impatient. Maybe I should go on some shorter time frame when there is less uh, a necessity to wait." Okay, I'm bad at managing waiting, so let's get into areas where I don't need to wait. Fuck that. What you're actually doing is using a very negative feedback loop out there because what you're going to be doing is anytime you get the reward, good trade, bad trade, whatever, it's going to trigger dopamine release much more than serotonin, which we said is addictive and can seriously impact decision-making processes because most of the time it's going to inflow a fucking lot into the amygdala, which means you just took a trade, great, the pleasure, gratifying, immediate, which means dopamine release mostly into the amygdala, which, okay, great, amygdala is now stimulated, which means your next trade is probably going to be much more amygdala, amygdalianly impacted. Don't know if this word exactly exists, but at least you get the point. So you're actually putting yourself into less favorable conditions for the next trade. That doesn't mean the next trade will fail, but you're putting yourself some handicap out there. Where serotonin instead just doesn't impact. It's a pleasant feeling of happiness that can help condition your brain to be more accurately uh, looking and managing patients later on. So positive feedback loop versus negatively impacting loop in here. Okay, very important for you to understand that. So short-term bullshit of scalping when you're a beginner just don't get the fuck out there it's really way too dangerous the most profitable time frames for a beginner is intraday intra swing and you understood that if you go on longer time frames what we said before you're putting yourself into another type of handicap of being totally under too much pressure to handle the time scale so it's really sitting in between which is the best intraday intra swing definitely the best possible way for you to start trading Okay, the closer you get to short-term decisions, the more immediate the reward system and gratifying systems will be and therefore favoring dopamine, which is actually going to destroy or impact most of your uh, benefits um, that you get. Okay, so by trying to managing impatience by shorter time frames, you're actually destroying what you're getting, what you're gaining on the opposite hand by using your uh, um, fear of uncertainty bias as management. Okay, so that leads us to this area. Uh, uh, oh, Jesus, I, I should have translated this, I forgot. Uh, okay, anyway, I'm going to translate it for you. So anyway, it's pretty easy for you to understand French anyway. So this is chaotic system. So as you get confronted to a chaotic system, that's what we've seen earlier. There is either a rational analysis or uncertainty biases management of the information. Basically, you just try to analyze something that doesn't even make sense until you get bored and you're going to trigger a Mygdalian response, which is going to favor the limbic system later on, which is going to negative feedback loop toward more uncertainty biases. And on the opposite hand, a rational answer using a strategy and uh, 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 um, a rational approach is going to favor hippocampal connections and therefore reinforcing mesocortical pathway as an anticipated release uh, uh, of dopamine. Okay. Uh, As you get to make your analysis, you get to build a plan, okay? And building a plan gives you two outcomes. Either you're going to immediately act because you figured out there was a speculative area out there and you were dealing with this right now. So there is, uh, uh, this is right now, you can act, okay? But you've made a a pre-existing analysis, okay? So of course, don't rush things, but when action is necessary, act, just tell about it, okay? So remember that when there is a stress, there is a release of dopamine when the stressful situation is over, okay? So, and it's going to favor what has managed to cause the initial, uh, to solve the stressful problem. So if you've used the rational part of your brain, cortical functions to solve the problem, build by building a plan and deciding that you need to act, you're going to get a dopamine release into the mesocortical system. Okay, but as it is an immediate response, it is dopamine. It's, it is not going to be serotonin. You had stressful situations, you just managed it, and you get the release, which is going to be dopamine. Okay, the other option is I have to wait. I figured out my plan, but I'm not yet there, and uh, or I'm in the speculative area, but I still don't have signals. I got to wait anyway. So, 
when you wait, you're going to have two options, okay? At that point, anyway, you just terminated the stressful situations. You've made your analysis and you've got an answer. You need to wait, which means same thing goes in here. You've used your mesocortical pathway and you solidified it because you just got uh, some dopamine into it, okay? But you're also using hippocampal reactions because in here waiting suggests you're going to have to store information somewhere and therefore it's very positive because it's reinforcing hippocampal connections in here that's great but impatience biases management helps you reinforcing even more the hippocampal connections okay so using alert is very positive in here because otherwise you're putting yourself at risk of using impatience biases troubles which is basically going to say okay i need to wait but if i look at the charts Okay, it's going to act as a stimuli, okay? And at some point, the stimuli means if you fail down the impatience biases, you just can't control yourself. What that means, that generally means you're surrendered to amygdalian stimuli, okay? Sensory stimuli or whatever. And basically, it's going to be amygdalian supposed response, which is going to trigger stress. You, sol you put a solution to the, tr to the stress because you're going to act, so acting is a solution, which means it's going to release dopamine into the mesolimbic system, which is going to force you an even stupider decision later on. You just acted, but entering the trade is not the end of a trade. There is trade management. So we, what that means is that going from an impatience trigger for a trade leads you to a negative feedback loop in here because you are badly going to manage this trade because you just got yourself under dopamine release into the mesolimbics uh, way, which means amygdalin response will be even more favorable as the amygdala is stimulated by the dopamine. So you just acted and you're probably going to doubt a lot or whatever. You're going to feel a shit ton of emotions, which is going to create even more incentive to act stupidly by another impatience biases. So you need to understand that impatience bias upon acting and triggering a trade triggers more impatience biases when you're going to need to manage the trade. Okay, which is going to lead to even more failure for these trades because, of course, a trade has only two outcomes either it's suspect, sorry, successful or it's a failure. There is, of course, in between solutions, but we're not going to deal with them. Okay, so what matters in here is that in the possibility of a failure, you're going to figure out the shit you've done. You're going to say, man, I should never have entered this thing. I was impatient and then I doing shit with my risk management. As the traumatized uh, experience is terminated, your mind will come clear and you're going to understand that you've done shit, which is going to be very painful for you and releasing a shit ton of cortisol. You're going to be just like, uh, uh, feeling pain at some point, you're going to say, shit, I'm really an asshole, okay, self-blaming possibilities and stuff like that, absolutely negative behavior, definitely not going to help you progressing into trading, as blaming yourself is definitely not good and doesn't bring anything positive. But the worst in here is that even if you get to manage yourself into a successful outcome, things could actually turn out to be worse. You're still made a gain, which means in, in monetary perspective, that's good. You've made a gain, good for you. But in terms of psychological progress through a more profitable long-term trading, you actually just put a few steps backward and quite a few steps, actually. Because as this is delayed gratification, you're going to get serotonin. Yes, we got this one. But the problem is as you fought the markets, okay? Because remember that the uncertainty biases or impatience anyway as, as going to be amygdalian response. And amygdalian response is either fight or flight, okay? So, uh, sorry, flight or fight, basically, as I said the friend. So if you flight, or if you fly away, basically there's no trade to manage, so there's no success or failure. So it's actually going to be fighting response of the amygdala that we're going to be dealing with. But when you fight something and succeed, your brain is conditioned to trigger endorphin, which means in here we're going to have an another problem because another neurotransmitter is going to be down the road. Uh, this is not a neurotransmitter, and the endorphin is a hormone, uh, secreted by the pituitary gland, by the way. So endorphin, very dangerous, very addictive stuff. Lots of drugs are using endorphin or emulated endorphin or de endorphin derivatives, whatever. But you need to understand that the endorphin receptors into your brain and the body is very, very, not, very bad. So you're going to feel overconfidence with those things. This is an actually pain fucking killer. What the fuck do you need a painkiller on trading? You don't need these things. So... Uh, it's going to bring overconfidence, uh, um, 
addictive behaviors and stuff like that, very bad, bad thing. But the worst thing here doesn't even come from this because actually what endorphin is doing is it's going to inhibit GABA receptors, uh, GABA receptors, which is another neurotransmitter. And the thing is that we're going to use an indirect effect. GABA receptors are essential for some other brain connective stuff, but we're not going to go down this road. In here, it's really a huge catalyst on the GABA receptor. Uh, but as this catalyst is inhibited, what it's going to be doing is it's going to favor the uh, um, uh, dopamine release. Okay, so dopamine is inversely correlated to GABA. Uh, though as you inhibit GABA, you're going to increase dopamine release into the system. Which means, remember what we said, serotonin and dopamine can be released, but they're compensating on each other. So as you have a shit ton of endorphin, which is going to bring very bad behaviors anyway, uh, but I mean, if you're not stupid, you'll get through it. But the problem in here is that there's going to be a sustaining level of problem because as GABA receptors are inhibited or GABA secretion is inhibited, you're going to get more dopamine release, which is going to shrink serotonin. So in here, instead of learning how to get peaceful and positive uh, 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 feedback loop from serotonin receptors, which is going to feel happiness instead of pleasure. In here, it's going to be a lot about pleasuring yourself, which is going to be an addictive response. Definitely not good because as you go down this road, your brain is going to retain one thing, it's going to retain, oh man, when you do shit, I don't care, you make it great, just do it again, I like this thing, make me pleasurable the next time again. This is the easiest, fastest solution, and as it has been a success, you've just been taught a very, very bad long-term behavior out there, because you're actually just totally under biases, um, uh, uncertainty and impatience biases. And as those things are driving your decisions, they can still be successful, but the success itself, it's a very, very bad thing. You're not progressing, you actually eventually make Making money but in a very terrible way okay so let's have a quick look at the rational analysis up to uh, up to the end as you get to use alert to patiently wait you're on slip triggering the hippocampus when the alert triggers hippocampus again because of course you're gonna have to bring back the memory stuff so working the hippocampus in here as well therefore shrinking possible access to amygdala because of this inhibiting stuff we've talked about and later on, same thing, as you trigger the trade, it's either success or failure. But if you fail, yeah, a little bit of cortisol if you win serotonin. So this is definitely what we want. Here is a positive feedback loop against a negative one. So I hope you do understand how this thing works, how those two things are actually piling on top of the other. What we want is not just being good at managing uncertainty by a rational analysis. We also need to fight impatience biases because when you start with a rational analysis but you end up with an impatience biases, you're actually destroying what you've created out there and more or less you're actually going to step backward. So you really want to succeed at both and handling both in the same time. So both make sure that the strategy helps you analyzing with a rational way. Don't change the strategy stuff, whatever. Try to be as consistent as possible to get this anticipated positive feedback loop on the mesocortical dopamine release. Okay, and in the same time, you want to get not to feel into impatience biases because it's going to strengthen your hippocampus connections, therefore reducing amygdala response over time. But this is something that processes very slowly. But anyway, successful outcome will bring delayed response, which is going to be favored serotonin, which is very great because as you get used to serotonin versus dopamine, you're going to get used to happiness instead of pleasure, which is real great because your brain is going to memorize this thing and it's going to say, all right, in order to have happiness response, I remember how I did. I kind of like this thing, but I'm not definitely under uh, 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 emotional control and addiction to this thing. Okay. It's not addictive. It's just pleasurable. Okay. Of course, you're not going to make winning trades every day. So don't expect to get serotonin every fucking day. But anyway, serotonin as being far less addictive has a very positive feedback loop. And we're not even entering in here talking about the benefits of these hormones when it is in decent level. So don't over uh, explode yourself as being great. Otherwise, serotonin is probably going to be compensated by some other stuff that we'll talk about eventually when we get to make more of a hormonal endocrinal vision of this thing. Anyway, enough. We need to go conclusion right now.
All right, most of the conclusion have already been drawn in, in here, so you need to understand how this thing actually works. It's combining the two, we need to get an anticipated reward system totally favoring cortical functions instead of limbic functions, which is over time going to shrink access to the amygdala. Still are going to exist, you're still going to feel a little bit of fear, but it's going to be rapidly compensated. And as you get yourself into using this metal cortical pathway as anticipated things, you're going to get a little burst of automatic dopamine when you get to be confronted to market analysis, which means you got to have a more efficient brain. It's not going to be a shit ton of dopamine making you an absolutely great analyst one day to another. It's just a, a little help and it's always good to take. Help is always beneficial. So favor these connections and try to favor using memory over sentiments, okay? Therefore, learning the rules and having a very, very tough set of rules is going to help a lot, but indirectly by stimulating hippocampal connections instead of uh, uh, amygdalins by using these inhibitory systems that we talked about from the strio terminalis versus the fornix, okay? Uh, on top of this, we've highlighted the possibility of the delayed uh, gratification system that we're going to use a lot and we're going to trick and mind trick our mind to actually get to access limbic functions in here and to conditions our brain to look for serotonin instead of looking for dopamine release into this thing and it's going to teach us indirectly how to be patient. So. It's going to help you, gratifying you by being patient because you make a successful trade and that's great, but in the background, okay, subconsciously speaking, things will happen. And what will actually happen is that your brain will remember that and as you'll get to embrace serotonin over dopamine, your brain will actually say, all right, I kind of like serotonin more than dopamine, so you'll get used to patient behavior. And this is not just going to act in trading. This thing is going to impact your entire life, okay? The patience you get to learn into trading is going to help you being patient everywhere else. And that's a very valuable stuff. And I'm not even getting into the um, life coaching bullshit of people telling you that a patient person is the most successful person in life, whatever. You'll get richer if you're patient, if you have self-control. Well, it's not entirely false, but this is mostly bullshit. So it's not going to change your life, okay? But it's actually going to be a tiny help that we're willing to take. Anything that can help us out there is positive. We live into a freakingly dangerous thing. Learning trading is the, probably one of the most complicated stuff you'll get to do into your life. So a little bit of help is always good to take. Just like a little bit of happiness is good to take. And you might want to prefer happiness over pressure. And in order to do this, Impatience biases will definitely help you. How to fight impatience, use one of the five techniques, the, the most common techniques. You definitely have one already written into your brain. Just solidify those connections. So whenever you feel impatience, use the distraction or whatever solutions is yours and get to use it immediately. The most efficient way into trading is when you feel impatience, try to, try to diverge from the problem by setting alerts. That's definitely by far the most uh, the, the most, most effective way of avoiding the problem, okay? So use a lot as much as possible, try to be as rational as possible, and things will roll over over time. It takes six months to actually process these things, but if you actually succeed, when you get to analyze your former self six months ago, you'll say, oh man, I remember where I was, I definitely changed, okay? The change is not a radical, you being a new person, whatever, but these are subconscious behaviors that I've put it in place through time. And you'll say, yeah, I definitely feel it. I'm far less stressed. I have much more rational response to stressful behaviors. And on top of this, I favor uh, happiness over pleasure. I favor delayed response over immediate pleasure. Okay, that being said, I'm going to leave you guys with that. Wish you an, a, a pleasant day. See you guys into the next video in which we're going to start talking about trend following, which is, I guess, what you guys want to learn a lot about. Oh, sorry. Just a final quick recap instead of forgetting about it. Okay, uh, you can pause the video if you want to. See you guys later.